Welcome to this teacher's introduction to T-Physics. T-Physics is my educational Python game engine, which was built in order to enable learners to build games in a very simple engine. And in this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I approach the development of T-Physics and the learning theory behind my decision to build it. So a lot of my teaching practice stems from the work done by Seymour Papa. His seminal work, Mindstorms, is focused on how computers will permeate the way that people um, think. It will change the way that people approach thinking. Um, and he tried to envision a world in which computers are used in everyday life. Well, of course, we're in that world now. And it's interesting on the other side of it to look back at Papert's ideas. One of the key things that Papert talks about in his book is the idea of living in a world which has sufficient exposure to the tools to learn specific things. An example that he gives is French. So if we were to look at a French classroom um, in a school, in a UK school, we might look at French as a subject and say that's really difficult. French is a difficult subject to learn. But actually, if we go to France and we look at very young children, we see that French is quite easy to learn. So if we based our observations on how children in British classrooms and UK classrooms struggle to learn French, we might come to the wrong conclusion and assume that French is hard. Papert's conjecture is that where we see mathematical, logical thinking is something that is hard to learn and hard to gain for children and, and students in schools, that actually, if we consider creating a math land, uh, a, a math speaking world for children to grow up in and learn in, then we might make the learning of maths, mathematics, mathematical thinking a lot easier. So Papa builds on Piaget's theory of constructivism. In constructivism, Piaget talks about learning by building, but in it, he posits that some things are harder to learn than others. And he talks about reaching adult thinking in, adver in adver inverted commas, which will be a stage in teenage years where children develop formal thinking skills and they're able to learn complex topics like maths. As we've already talked about, Papa doesn't necessarily see maths as something that's hard to learn, but he sees maths as more difficult for children to learn if they aren't exposed to mathematical thinking. So for an example, a child has a father who is a engineer and a mother who is a mathematician, that child might grow up in a math speaking household. And when they get to school, they will speak maths and they will be able to learn mathematics without too much difficulty. The majority of children don't grow up in math speaking households. In fact, they grow up in mathophobic households. So we need to consider how we try and create a math land in a school environment, a safe place that is full of the tools required for a child to learn maths. The way that I have seen this in my own teaching is through engagement. And the problem here is that actually the to create a math land in which children naturally start to learn maths, we probably need to do that at a very early age. Creating a safe environment into which to learn maths is something that we can do in the classroom, but by the time children have arrived in schools, they might already be mathophobic. They have a phobia of learning maths. They've been told they're not good at it, they've been told they'll never be good at it, and they've started to believe it. So we need to, we need to get those children engaged. On the right-hand side, I've got an example of what I typically see as a learning activity in classrooms when looking at computer science. We say, do your children know how to do a print? Do they know how to do a variable or an if statement? We talk about it in a very pragmatic way as if coding is something to do, as if the different tools within a coding language are, are just you know, something that we do. Like you might not necessarily go into an art classroom and say, do your children know how to hold a pencil, for example? And that's the way that I see this, this type of thinking. 
Instead, I like to frame the question around children's programming ability in terms of how they're able to use those tools. So rather than saying, do the children know how to do a print statement? Do they know how to write an if statement? Instead, I might say, do the children, do the learners understand that a print statement is a powerful tool to show information to the user? or a powerful debugging tool where we can output information partway through an algorithm to try and work out where we're going wrong. Do they understand that an if statement is a powerful tool for controlling the flow of logic through a program? So I think a reframing of this is really important, but also the learning activity on the right here is very, is very dry. It's not meaningful. It's not concrete. The children can't see any point in doing it necessarily. Um, and yes, you might get children that see this and say, let's build a chatbot, but actually that might be a small percentage. The reason that I built T-Physics is because I wanted access to a tool which empowered those learners to learn and empowered them to want to learn to code. The majority of young children will be interested in games. Not everyone, this doesn't cover everyone, but certainly a higher percentage will be interested in building games than most other learning activities that I've found. And the reason I wanted to build T-Physics was I found that existing en engines, things like Unity, things like Pygame as well, were a little bit too complex. I like to think about this the way that you might look at a child learning art. If you've got a really young child and you try and give them a, a paint set, a you know professional paint set, um, you know some uh, uh, the tools for them to mix colours, um, you know they might not be able to use them. They don't have the dexterity, they don't have the understanding of color mixing to create artwork with those tools. And if you give them those tools and they don't know how to use them, they might just become disinterested. Whereas if we give our children some big coloring crayons and just kind of let them go wild, their little hands can grab those crayons. You know, it, we've created a tool that's suitable for that level. And even though those tools are simple, they a child with crayons with a creative spark can create some fantastic pieces of artwork. And T Physics is designed to try and be a bit of a first crayon set in the world of game engineering. What I've done is I've scaled everything back. T Physics is extremely simple, it just has shapes and some collision detection. And the reason that I've done that is I've tried to create a very basic tool set so that working in that confined space, the children, the learners, adapt and create within those constraints and they get very they get very capable within those constraints and they actually learn a lot of fundamentals through doing it and on the right hand side you can see an example of a, of a typical challenge i'll give to a first time programmer in t physics i'll say look this game you know we, we create a game we create a player as a circle and then we look at this if statement and if they've done any scratch this is really easy to explain if not there might be a little bit more conversation around what's happening by say look we're checking if the up key is pressed and then if it is uh, we increase the y position of the player again you might need to te uh, teach coordinates cartesian coordinates and how that works if they've done scratch they might know that inherently and once we've done this you can now leave the child to create on their own you can say okay now that we've got this can you add this code can you make something happen can you add in some additional code that will add the ability for the player to move in all directions so a lot of the basis for t physics was wanting a simpler abstraction for a game engine and there's this game called thomas was alone i suggest you take uh, you check it out if you don't know it already in the game you play as thomas this little red rectangle and thomas is just a shape but through narration through mechanics we are told what thomas is feeling we are told what is he is observing he has some friends as well and he might like the friends or dislike the friends and what this does is it creates a real connection with thomas as a character he's just a red rectangle but by the end of the game we feel like we know that rectangle it's an abstract concept that this is an actual person thomas is a person we can identify with that so through creating t physics i wanted to just create a really simple engine in which shapes were used to give learners a natural understanding of abstraction if a child can create any type of game in t physics where the player is represented by a circle and the enemies are represented by red rectangles for example 
um, you know, maybe bullets are little black rectangles that fire out. If they're able to do that, then they develop a natural sense of abstraction because they are abstracting away from reality as they do that. It also teaches very pure collision detection because if you only have shapes and those shapes can collide, children develop a natural understanding for collision detection. They don't need to be taught it. So when we get to more complex tutorials, more complex game engines like Pygame, and we have collision detection running underneath a sprite system, it makes a lot more sense. So one important thing that I did with T-Physics is I've turned it into a single file game engine. At first it wasn't. I used to install it via the PyPy um, PIP uh, installation system. And the trouble I had with that was when I was working in schools and I was speaking to the IT technicians and saying, can we please install this game library? They'd say, well, what is it? And I'd say, it's this game library. I wrote it and they'd say, well, we don't trust it. We don't know what it is. We're not going to install it. And I found that this has been a difficulty with, you know, a lot of requested libraries over the years. So I wanted to create something that could be included anywhere. So if you have Python installed on your machines, particularly Idle is a good one, but if you have a Python installation on your machines, which has Turtle, you can make use of T-Physics. And that was the intention. The other side of this is by having that code visible. So instead of us importing it um, by including, like downloading it and installing it to our Python installation, we copy the T-Physics code from the repository. We copy the code itself and we put it into a file and we store it in a directory. And then when we make games in that directory, we use files input, uh, Python's import system to import everything from the Python T-Physics Python file. I've seen learners as young as eight open up the source code for T-Physics and start to make their own changes. It demystifies the idea of a library no longer is a library something that's really complex and written by some coding genius and you know bundled up it's meaningful you can you can open it up you can look at it you can see how it works it demystifies this idea of libraries and actually it turns it it starts to blur the distinction between game engineer and game programmer and it starts to um, turn any of your game programming learners into game engineers as well. They understand the what and the why of what they're building and how. And the last really important thing I did with T-Physics is I made it render using the turtle. You can see here on the right hand side that we are rendering with pen up, pen down. You know, we're using t.forward, t.right to draw a rectangle. This is turtle with extra steps. So we've hidden the turtle, we've, dis we've disabled the tracer so that things appear more animation-like and between each frame we clear the screen, we draw a new screen, we clear the screen, we draw a new screen. But ultimately, every frame of a game in T-Physics could be manually drawn out using the turtle. And since most students, if not all, will have interacted with turtle at some point, this creates a real connection with them. There's no magic going on here. They understand that when they are moving shapes around the screen, underneath they are manipulating the physics of the game. And at the top level, we then render it and they understand that it's being rendered using the turtle. So I hope you've enjoyed this introduction where I've explained the what's and the why. Now I'm going to take you through a really simple and quick example of how I might approach introducing T-Physics to learners. So first and foremost, T-Physics is available on GitHub at this link here. So github.com slash the Billington slash T-Physics. And you can do some variation of Google searches to hopefully find this. Once we have found the reposit repository itself, uh, there are some YouTube tutorials that I have aimed at learners. This one in particular explains how Turtle is used for rendering. I definitely recommend giving that a watch if you haven't already. And then I've started to put a playlist together where I'll be slowly rolling out more tutorials. In here we have a full explanation of how a lot of the different functions of T-Physics works. And then we also have an examples and a tutorials directory. In the examples, um, I've got different you know, lesson plans um, just a load of variations of different things, but a really great thing that I'll show you in a minute is learners can just come in here, grab different types of games, see how they work. Um, you know, you might end up with kids playing games in lessons, but when we're doing games programming, it can start to blur the lines uh, a little bit at times. And as I've said already, engagement's really important. 
we also have some tutorials this is a new thing I've started to put together um, where it's it's essentially the same as the YouTube tutorials and it's slowly building up the functionality of a game I'll, I'll maybe add some more to these over time but the intention is that once learners have spent a little bit of time with t-physics they won't need that many examples they might need to refer back to here but hopefully they'll become learners and creators games programmers in their own right so I've clicked through into the tphysics.py file here and now all I need to do is I'm going to copy it and I'm going to grab this code and I'm going to store it on my local machine so I'm going to open up idle I'm going to create a new file I'm going to paste my tphysics code into this file and we're going to save it and we're going to call it and this is really important I'm going to call it tphysics.py okay and once we've done that we can now import tphysics from any file in the same folder in the same directory so I'm going to create another new file and we're going to save this it's going to go in the same directory and I'm going to call it game.py and now we can start to write our game so I'm going to and this is the sort of thing that I'd maybe take students through stood at the front of the class with the whiteboard maybe show them what you're doing and then have some sort of tutorial together you know give them some time to download T physics get it running and I'd stage this up so the first thing I'd do is I'd show them how to import T physics and create a basic game so we're going to create a game object we're going to give it a title basic game you can give it any title you want and uh, we're going to give it a background color of green we're then going to create a player this is going to be a circle and uh, you should see that when oh that didn't work uh, so sometimes I'm not sure uh, what idle needs in order to um, CT physics but if I um, basically if we go into T physics you'd be able to see that a circle has a, a number of parameters that we need to pass to its initializer it's going to be an X a Y a radius and a color that's referenced in the repository itself and it also does show up here I don't know what the requirements for it to show up here are for the import to work um, in fact maybe it needs to be um, if we import game and we import circle like that if we actually reference them no so um, let's grab a circle and we're going to create it in the center of the screen zero zero it's going to be our x and y coordinates uh, we're going to give it a radius of 10 and we're going to set its color to yellow we're then going to add it to the game and in fact I actually quite like to skip adding it to the game at this point and um, because it's really good uh, to to show the students so actually what we'll do is we'll get rid of the player for now and we're just going to create our game loop um, our game loop is an infinite loop and I like to explain that every time we draw a new frame uh, we need it to happen in an infinite loop so the game keeps running and then every um, every time we draw a new frame we're going to do all of our physics updates move all of our stuff around draw the next frame I like to reference like a flick book for as an example of how frames are generated um, so you might want to get started with something just like this so we've created a basic game and then uh, we update it on every game tick from ah, here we go so it should be from tphysics import game circle so let's run that and there you go you have a basic game with a green background now I'm hoping that that was because of the syntax error I'm hoping that now when we create our player and we create a circle there we go so we get told what our parameters are so we've got x y radius and color so we're going to put in zero zero as our x and y our radius is going to be 10 and our color let's make it blue instead of the default which is yellow and then at this point I'd say to these students what's going to happen when I run the code and they go so there's going to be a blue circle in the middle of the screen and I'm going to go uh, no there isn't because we've created the circle but in order for T physics to know about it we need to add it to the game so we add our shape to the game and we're going to pass our player in here and there we go now at this stage um, I will show the students we'll take the player X coordinate and we're going to add one to it every frame and here I can explain that we keep redrawing it in a new position wait a little bit draw it wait a little bit draw it and every time we do that we move and we can show them a really simple animation then we might say to them but I don't always want to move if it's a game when might I want to move to the right and the students might say well you'd move to the right when the right key is pressed so we can say if game dot is pressed and we're going to check for the right key press this needs to be a capital R this is a really good way to get the students aware of syntax and how important uh, case sensitivity can be 
So we're going to run that and you might even want to get a student up, run it and say, can you come press the right key? And every time they press the right key, it moves to the right. You say, how do we move to the left? And they might press the left key and go, oh, that's not working because we haven't coded it yet. And that's where you can leave this and say to them, OK, now it's your turn. You write this up. Um, and you'll notice that, uh, you know, some students might do this kind of thing. They might do plus equals minus one. They might have, you know, minus equals one here. Um, you know, if they've got a lowercase letter here, then they'll get thrown an error. A common issue that I've started to see, um, funnily enough, is uh, students doing something like this, where they try and recreate the while true loop, the game loop as well. Now, when this happens, if they're familiar with Scratch, a really useful way to explain what a infinite loop is, is if you come into Scratch and you go on create, and we just go into control and we grab forever. If I say, so a while true loop's like a forever loop and everything inside of it um, will run forever. And I say, why can't I add another forever loop to the bottom? Why isn't there a little connector the same way there is for the repeat? And the student might say, oh, that's because if you're in a forever loop, you can't go into another forever loop. And I say, yes. Exactly. So that is a really good explanation for why we, you know, why this second true loop isn't isn't needed. I don't know why so many people make that mistake, but it is a common one that I've seen. Um, some people might get incorrect X and Y, but the important thing is because they're building for themselves, you can start to understand how much they actually understand. You can see it, and you can give them meaningful feedback. Um, one thing I do find is students can struggle with blocks a little bit so this is the one downside of Python in my opinion for learning um, if you had uh, you know a Java function that looked like this um, it would look something like that okay and in Java we have instead of just the colon um, and then on the next line tabbing in and tabbing out to close the block we actually have these block openers and closing this is really helpful because it really it's much easier to explain what's happening inside of a block. In Python, it's not as easy. So what I like to try and do is show the students something like this. I'll say for i in range 10, print hello. And then we'll tab out, back in, tab back to the baseline, and we'll say print uh, test. And I'll say to them, what's that going to print? And some students will go, it'll print hello 10 times and then test. If they say that, they understand blocks. It's fine. <laughs> If you get anyone that says it'll oh, print hello test hello test hello test then you need to explain how blocks work and this is a really good way to do that because you can explain to them that these this tab in means that this lives inside this block and then we can again we can say well what about this so then what's this going to print and you know these these don't need to be hello test they can be anything and they might say oh let's press print hello test free hello test free and you'll be able to show them that. So we can explain the difference between why this is in the block and why this isn't. Um, that tends to be one of the bigger hurdles. Now, just really quickly, because I'm wary of us uh, taking quite a long time, if we go into T-Physics and we grab an example, so I do quite like this AIM trainer, actually. I think this is a really good one um, for, for showing the complexity of how much you can achieve with T-Physics. So I'm going to just copy this. And I'm going to paste it into here and we're going to run it and we have an aim training game where it will count up my score over time and at this point you know it, once students have this they're going to be really interested they're going to be like oh wow look how cool this is look at you know can i change the color and then they're going to be looking in the code to look at changing the color can i make it so the sphere goes bigger can i make it so you get more points um, and you know we're showing we can output text we're using key presses so we can play again we're starting to look at how you build a finite state machine in the sense that um, you know we're checking for the r press only if targets remaining equals zero so to keep track of how many targets are left we count it down every time we click on a target and when it gets to zero we can add this special check into our game loop which will output the end game text and then listen for the r key press so we're starting to look at the basics of how you'd create a state machine so it's quite a simple tool, but as I've said, I, I think that that's a really good thing. Um, the reason I've done that is because I think that you can still use it to do some quite complex things and actually makes those complex things a little bit easier because the tools themselves are simple. I am more than happy to talk about T-Physics. If you have any questions about it, you can always reach me on my LinkedIn. Um, so if you go to LinkedIn, uh, my name is Billy Rebecca. I will quickly show you. So. Come, grab me on LinkedIn, send me any messages. Once again, 
MIT physics is available on GitHub. It's open source. It will remain open source forever. And you can access it through my GitHub link. Um, and yeah, good luck and have fun using it in the classroom.